Well, thank you very much, young Mary, and a very engaging and interesting quality-focused session addressing Top Gun technology. And technological change in PV sometimes feels like it takes a very long time to arrive, and then on other times, it feels like it occurs overnight. As Jörg Althaus said, the technology cycles are becoming increasingly short. One such switch is from multi-crystalline to mono that we've seen bifacial becoming mainstream, and then the rapid adoption of uh, multi-bus bar technology. These are all notable recent technological examples of change. And in 2023, it feels like another technological transition is underway, this time from P-type cells to N-type, with Topcon, as we've heard, currently the dominant N-type technology in terms of volume. My name is Jonathan Gifford. I'm the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine Global, and welcome to this next session of our Roundtables EU 2023 Next Generation Cell and Module Technology. But how exactly this transition from P to N will play out will be defined by quite a few different variables, including the current cell and module oversupply dynamic. The same is true of the progress of back contact technologies. In this session, we're going to discuss these developments and learn more as to what can be expected in this yet another period of great change. A little later, we'll bring together a panel of experts, including leading N-type cell and module producers, a testing provider, and a major European utility. But first, we have a presentation from a cell and module maker that I think we can honestly say was a bit of a hidden champion of PV production in the past. Tongwei Solar, or TW Solar, was primarily known as a cell producer and key supplier to many of the better known PV brands. And in that time, Tongwei became a relatively early adopter in China of heterojunction technology, which was back in 2019. And the company has since expanded into module production, including high efficiency shingled products, which is known as the Terra module series. Uh, across six production bases, Tongwei now claims a cell capacity of 70 gigawatt, with plans to expand that to a pretty astounding 150 gigawatts by 2026. Jason Chia is the director of module R&D at Tongwei, and he joins us today. Welcome to our Roundtables Europe 2023, Jason. And uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thanks for the introduction. Today, I will give a presentation on high efficiency and type module roadmap for the PV industry. My topic will be divided into three parts. Firstly, I will give, give, give a short introduction about Tongwei. Go through the Tongwei's PV industry chain, we have the largest polysilicon capacity in the world. The annual capacity now is 420,000 tons and will reach around 1 million tons in the next couple of years. Our ingot and uh, wafer capacity now is, is 15 gigawatt and will reach more than 47 gigawatt in future. Our solid cell capacity right now is 90 gigawatt, also ranked number one in solid sale shipment for six consecutive years. Sale capacity will expand to around 150 gigawatt in the next year. Module level, we are, we are ranked in tier one and have 55 gigawatt end capacity in this year and plan to have more than 100 gigawatt in future. Our R&D is distributed in two locations. Most of them are in Chengdu, Sichuan province. Technically, for HED, we started China's first gigawatt HED production line in 2021. And then we built a new R&D lab on advanced modernization primarily for HED in Sichuan, also in 2021. For TNC, means Tongwei N-type CO, we set up G12 wafer size IMD 9 in 2020. We also have dedicated pipeline for IBC development and well equipped Paris guide and HED tandem developed lab. We spent tens of million IMB to build solar cell characterization lab. Till now, we have two module IMD pipelines in Anhui and Hefei. Uh, Chengdu uh, city. 
for shingling and uh, half-cut module technology development. Meanwhile, the two module reliability testing lab are all are both CNAS certified. We are going to have a new reliability lab with area of 7,000 square meters in the next year, which should be the largest module reliability laboratory in the world. Tongwei have, uh, has all, over 600 IND researchers cover, covering all PV tech technology field. Tongwei has all, already published 1,822 patents by the three, Q3 of this year. Let's take an overview of the Tongwei's module products for the recommendation. Shingled all black modules and a TNC black module for residential application. M10 TNC modules for utility for and the commercial rooftop. Most important is the two new products on the right. One is TNC module with GTFR seals with wattage up to 620. And the other is THC module with GTF H80 seals and the wattage is up to 730. Let's take a look at the TNC new product firstly. Due to 66 pieces per module only, uh, sales per, per module only, GTFR module can have nine less, nine percent less open circuit voltage than traditional M10 or G11L module with 72 sales, which results in about two pieces more modules installation in one string in this field. That is 12% less strings for the same system capacity. Also due to higher power output, GTF module can reduce land space by about 9% about compared to the M10 module. Considering advantages on string length, and land space. We have calculated both an LCOE of the utility systems in the world, such as Europe, Asia, South Africa, and, and it is Asia. The average results show that G12 module can decrease by 1% for both and by 0.6% for LCOE than G11L module and decrease by 2% for both, 1% for LCOE than M10 module. Because of a higher power efficiency, lower annual degradation, lower temperature coefficient, TNC module can have higher electricity generation per watt than PUG module. Take a PV system, demonstration in Hainan province in China, for example. Electricity generation per watt of TNC module is 3.34% higher than that of PUG module running from March to November of this year in the field. The other new product is THC module uh, with wattage up to uh, 730 and the mod module efficiency reaching 23.5 percent combined with g12 size ultra thin wafer bifacial nano crystallian silicon deposition silver free metallization cell technologies and uh, zero bus bar module technologies which demonstrated excellent performance of high reliability, high power output, and a competitive cost. Also due to higher by efficiency, higher no irradiance performance, lower annual degradation, degradation and uh, temperature coefficient, power generation per watt during the whole life of 
THC module in the field will be 4.6% higher than that of PERC module. Combined with the lower boss because of how high module power, the LCOE of a THC module will be decreased by 4.53% compared to the M10 PERC module. How can we get make such high performance HGAD module? Let's go inside to find the answer. When we began developing HGAD technology in 2018, building its gigawatt level HGAD production line in China in 2021, when we pioneered the introduction of bifacial nanocrystallian silicon into HGAD. By Q1 of this year, HAD champion efficiency reached 26.49%. 20, when we built the, the first pilot plant to implement and develop copper interconnection technology realized silver free. Currently, the width of the fingers has been reduced to less than 15 micrometer, enhancing the efficiency by 0.2% in comparison to the printing process. Tongwei THC module technology package includes many three elements. Firstly, zero bus bar reduced welding pad to enhance efficiency and is more compatible with ultra Thin wafer. Secondly, UV conversion technology is used to convert high energy UV light into visible blue light, avoiding UV ID and uh, further in increasing the module power. The, the power gain is more than two watt in comparison to high transmittance film. Thirdly, directional reflection technology can enhance another two watt the mechanical strengthen of the real class. Packaging all the techno HVAD technologies from wafer to, to module above, you will get the high power output and reliable THC module performance. Our THC modules have achieved excellent performance, not only on IEC standard reliability test, but also combined, combined aging test such as UV plus thermal coupling and UV plus damp heat. Even five times IEC reliability test such as thermal couple 10,000 test, the module power degradation is less than 2.5%. With HVD technology from wafer to module developing accumulation, we have break Tongwei's HVD module power record for five times in this year, from about 720 to 745 watt, which is certified by TUV sort. Finally, I will make a summary. Tongwei will put GTFR TNC module and GTFR THC module, new products into the market in next year. GTFR will further reduce BOSS and LCOE in comparison to not only M10, but also G11L. THC module packaged series of Tongwei HVD technologies and will bring higher power output, more reliability, lower LCOE values to the customers. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. It's Yap from uh, Tongwei Solar, the director of module R&D. I think there's a lot to unpack there. So many figures and record-breaking figures, or at least extremely notable figures, up above 700 watts for module power output. We've got efficiencies in commercial production, from what I could see, up above 23%. Um, on the cell level, looking at efficiencies up towards 26%, lower LCOE um, and, and higher 
power output based on the advantages of heterojunction technology. Also, copper metallization, silver-free metallization. There is really a lot of technology going on. And as I mentioned right at the introduction, um, it seems like the rate of technology change is faster than ever. Ever. Jason Chia from Tongwei Solar, thank you very much for giving us a run through of the latest technological developments at Tongwei. Um, coming up in just a moment, we'll convene our panel of experts to discuss technology, including some of the advantages and challenges with heterojunction in just a moment. Well, I think it's helpful to take a closer look at how very large solar manufacturers are looking to boost performance and achieve competitive cost structures with high efficiency technologies, while also developing the truly next generation of solar cells, things like perovskites. But of course, none of this development occurs in a vacuum, and there's currently a surplus of PV cells and modules on the market, and prices are falling fast. So, how will this impact the development and the deployment of next generation PV modules? And could it bring with it quality risks, such as uh, new technologies often can in the PV industry? Let's hear from our experts, our panelists at this next generation cell and module tech session at Roundtables Europe are uh, Christian Comas, the Director of Business Development Europe for Huasan, Gregory Lukop, the Solar Procurement Manager at Angie. Uh, Jersey Rudeniki, the Senior Product Manager for Ryzen Energy, and Yunche Yan, the Senior Technical Expert with TÜV Sud, Greater China. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining Roundtables Europe 2023. All right, Gregory, Hi. straight to you. As, as a large utility and project developer in the solar space, I understand that you're looking to actually work with more localized module producers along with your regular partners in places like Europe and the EU. Um, earlier in the year and last year, we saw a lot of development in terms of uh, production capacity being proposed, um, some of it being developed outside of China. But now we've seen these rapidly falling prices. How does that change things for you as a, a large company like NG? But it is impacting. Uh, let's be uh, let's be honest, because the business model that the supplier put was a business model based on the, uh, let's say, thirty cents, and uh, now we are uh, uh, really really lower, uh, uh, almost uh, before the uh, the middle, uh, two fifteen. So uh, yes, it's impacted. But in energy, we are uh, pushing to find new suppliers and helping them to relocate in uh, in Europe. That's the first thing, because you know that NZIA is, uh, has been signed at Zero Industry Act, and this is something uh, uh, we are dealing with. Um, if we speak about US, it's a completely different market when you need also to be uh, uh, inland, because we understand that the laws are pushing that way, uh, with the IRA, uh, which is Inflation Reduction Act, which is uh, granting uh, um, tax benefits, and it's changing completely the game. So uh, we are sure that U.S. will start first because there is lots of openings already in U.S. And we believe that Europe will come fast. So we would like to be ready. OK, thank you, Gregory. We'll be observing the space. Absolutely, for sure, things are changing fast. Um, Jan, from uh, Tuf Sud's uh, perspective, um, what would you say about with lower prices, does that bring with it uh, technology risks? You're in testing and quality assurance. Uh, why speak about the technology risks? For sure, uh, there are some concerns. Uh, and that's something I can't deny because we have already seen some failure uh, during the long-term extended stress test uh, because currently we test and uh, certificate the model quality based on the IEC standards 61250 and 6. Uh, 7030. These standards are intended to verify the early stage failure. So uh, that are as usual, like design defects and also uh, like those firmware PID such effects. But however, it doesn't uh, cover long term durability. So uh, when we see the cost reduction, so the manufacturer they are trying to. Uh, change their uh, material or 
uh, components in order to get lower price or minimize their costs. So the models always change. So that's why we get uh, a lot of requirements about retesting because something changed with their model. And it happened so fast that we don't have time for the long-term durability test. So there, uh, and also we have seen some failure like uh, broken glasses and corrosion of fingers and bus bars during the uh, extended stress testing. Uh, it is already something happened and it's a warning. So uh, that's, I have to say, there is some risks. Mm, okay, interesting. So the bill of materials and some of the manufacturing materials and techniques can change quite rapidly as companies looking, look to cut costs and stay competitive. Christian Comas from Huasan, bringing you into the conversation. You're an industry veteran with some decades of experience, close to two decades of experience in PV. Um, is this kind of back to the future for you, another period of rapidly falling prices? Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, yes, so this is like uh, Groundhog Day, maybe, repeating itself, uh, different situation though. And uh, it is quite interesting for me to see what's gonna happen this time. Uh, if we look back to the past, uh, what happened when we had this kind of situation before was mostly a supply chain reshaping. This means that uh, in some occasions, uh, distributors who were maybe acting uh, not only as distributors for uh, downstream, but maybe even for projects, many of them went bankrupt. That was uh, 15 years ago, almost. In some of the occasions, what happens is that some of the supply chain is making a lot of profit and that ends because of the lower prices and maybe new players enter the market in that moment. The other thing that could happen is that manufacturers with a, uh, antiquated technology in production with a large uh, production base enter in difficulties. And other thing that happens is vertical integration of manufacturers. That was something that happened as well. So we have like a menu of things that have happened in the past, but we don't know which one of those points will be applicable for the future, if any of those, or we will be surprised um, the other thing that really happened that I find even more interesting than just a commercial reshaping is the fact that with lower prices, uh, there is a change in the application. So, for instance, uh, two axis trackers died with the reduction of cost that happened 12, 15 years ago because they were not economic, uh, economically viable. viable. And as well that uh, new application fields in terms of the end user appear with lower prices because then suddenly the LCO is lower. So it's really quite an interesting time for everybody. And we are really looking forward, for instance, to the possibility with the reduced price and low LCOE of truly autark systems being compatible or even competitive in cost of energy with established grids and wide distribution grids, even in countries that are uh, well industrialized. So let's see, it's quite mm. an interest. It, it, that's um, a very good summary. I, I had written for myself something else is that uh, the focus on quality and reliability has to be put even more by the customers in these times, but I think that that was already covered. Yeah, absolutely, that is that is a point. But it, it is a time of great change, so great opportunities as well, um, but it will be a, a movable feast of, of challenges at the same time. Um, Josie Rudnicki from Ryzen Energy, bringing you into the conversation. Now, Ryzen is a little bit uniquely uh, positioned, at least in terms of uh, this session or this panel, because you supply both P-type and N-type uh, solar cells and modules. Uh, how does this kind of price di dynamic at the moment influence Ryzen's strategy in supplying the market? Well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it indeed influences us, uh, but I need to say that this year we are doing so far quite well, I must say. So we have already supplied uh, up to Q3 uh, more than 19 uh, gigawatt of uh, PV module, which is uh, more than the, 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 the whole last year that we have supplied. Um, how do we try to adapt to these uh, new conditions? Well, I can uh, list at least uh, two uh, steps that, that we have uh, already applied 
uh, last year and we're continue, continue, continuing uh, to apply this year. So first of all, uh, we are uh, looking at the suppliers, at the cost side. Okay, and here we are trying to become less dependent on the on the suppliers and on the on their prices. So we are becoming uh, more virtually integrated. So you know that we uh, at the end of the year we will have around 45 gigawatt of PV modules, 33 gigawatt of uh, PV cell capacity. Last year we have um, we have uh, started the polysilicon uh, manufacturing. Uh, around 12 kilotons per year. I know that is not maybe uh, the amount, uh, the, the biggest amount on the market. But again, these are the small steps that we are doing. And uh, this year we have already started also our wafer uh, ingot and wafer uh, manufacturing, uh, which will reach uh, 20 uh, gigawatt uh, of capacity very soon. So again, that is the first step of uh, becoming independent. The second step is we are trying to look at the customers, okay? So we are identifying uh, the independent or separate group of customers and identifying their needs. And then towards those needs, we are uh, further developing uh, our uh, products and targeting uh, these, uh, these customers. So you know we have three families of products. The Burke is more universal, uh, but this is the product for the for the actually for the customers that are very price sensitive. Okay, and then we have two other uh, families, and these products are for maybe uh, a slightly different uh, customer needs. Needs uh, we are speaking about the the Topcon. Uh, with uh, higher efficiency, higher reliability, uh, but also uh, at an affordable price. And this product uh, is more, I would say, for uh, we uh, design it more for commercial, industrial type of customer and residential with a specific functions uh, like full black and, and, and black frame. And the last uh, family of heterojunction, this is specifically for the utility, a high demanding utility, utility type of customer uh, with the supreme, uh, supreme uh, functions that we can uh, offer. So that is the, the, the at least these two steps um, we are uh, taking to uh, counteract this situation that is happening on the market. Okay, so a portfolio approach, you can offer different things to different customers. Uh, Gregory Likop from Angie, uh, as a buyer, is this, is this kind of the best of times for you because you've got um, module suppliers in sometimes a race to the bottom in terms of pricing or is this fraught with risk? Or even on the other side, is this an opportunity to explore these high performance technologies that perhaps would have been prohibitively highly priced? Um, this is a, a risk and an opportunity. You know, the, the, the solar market is moving very fast. And uh, I would say with the price that we see now, we need to be careful. And we need to use the best partners because we are not sure So, of uh, the suppliers that, that going to be there in, in two years. You know, finance is very tough now. And uh, uh, we, in our analysis, we have reached the bottom of their... Uh, of their prices and cost. So we need to be careful. On the other side, uh, it is enhancing the technology because the LCOE is very keen. So if for the same price we can have, you know, better yield or uh, an upgrade technology, this is a chance for us. And uh, we are already pushing Topcon and we are looking for AGT after. Huh? So it's both at the end. Okay. And you'll have to keep an eye on quality as well, I'm sure. Um, now, let's look at heterojunction in particular. We had the presentation before from Tong Wei with some really interesting and quite compelling numbers. Um, of course, one of the challenges to heterojunction in the past has been the very high uh, silver consumption, particularly in some of the kind of historic producers, Sanyo, um, Panasonic, uh, Christian Commerce, you know these producers very well, having uh, worked with um, some of them. But we've also saw from Tongwei there is pathways to reduce silver consumption quite dramatically in heterojunction technologies. Huasan is a pure play heterojunction manufacturer in China. What are your approaches to reducing silver and therefore reducing the cost of top of a heterojunction? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, there are several steps to reduce the consumption of uh, silver on the module as a whole. And they are all slightly different from each other, but some of them are already mass production. So what you can consider state-of-the-art heterojunction right now 
in mass production consumes already about 70% less silver than it was a few years back. So this is something that is being tackled and even with the processes that are not revolution, uh, any revolution, they are just applying things that have been proven to work, you can be on par with popcorn in terms of uh, silver consumption per vat. On top of that, you can have a zero silver, and this is mostly based on copper plating. And that is almost at mass production. Some players are putting it in mass production or uh, ramping up some production that is large, as maybe not mass production in the same sense. Uh, we need to remember that copper has some issues or some challenges in order to be applied well. And it is not the same applying copper for a technology that can be used at high temperature in the production of the cell and in the rest of the processes compared to low temperature. But what is reality today, maybe to give information to everyone as a bit of general culture, is that most of the reduction of the use of silver today happens using copper that is coated with silver maybe in wires, maybe in the uh, little pieces of metal that are on top of the uh, wafer, on top of the cell. And this is something that is widely understood today and it works really well and has been the main uh, workhorse of reducing the use of copper, uh, sorry, of silver on the cells. Okay, um, this so, is so it's, not, it's not entirely um, silver-free, but it's replacing some of the silver no, in the metallization. those are the low silver uh, technologies. Yep, so when silver. you get copper and you cover it uh, so, uh, with silver, that is, let's say, low silver consumption technologies. You have a process for truly zero silver. When I say truly, let's say this is at our conversation level. There is still silver use in some sense, but not in any quantity that causes any real cost. Okay. You... But that's a different approach. Copper plating, let's call it now. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Jan, can I come in as a quality assurance and testing provider to FSUD? Um, uh, can you talk me through some, what are the quality challenges with the use of copper then? With the use of copper? That's right. Um, yep. Uh, it's, uh, there are some, uh, there are many aspects. Uh, first one is that the environmental issues. Uh, I've uh, yeah, we had before that electro uh process to uh, uh, to replace the silver paste welding. So that's the problem. Uh, we finally gave up it is because the environment issues when we use this technology. And also, uh, we've mentioned the silver coated copper. Actually, it's a good idea to use silver coated copper. But the problem is that uh, in the heterojunction production yeah, process, the temperature is low. And at low temperature, this uh, silver coated copper, so uh, it's not as, fir as firm as at high temperature. So it will cause some problem when we put the models to thermal cycling tests. Sometimes the fingers will uh, break or if the uh, the contact will get lost, so it lose some yeah power. Mm -hmm. So that's mainly two problems of the copper. Yeah, yeah so the low temperature technology. processing itself, um, which is required. Maybe, maybe by let me add one point. Oh yeah, uh, sure, so, Christian, please jump in. Um, so one of the issues, uh, so silver coated uh, copper has uh, what she has mentioned needs to be taken well into account. But I think in the industry, and I'm talking about the suppliers of technology that we all manufacturers have, not specifically about us, uh, that has been probably solved uh, already now. But uh, copper itself uh, rusts very much. So if you have copper grains and the ambience has some kind of uh, humidity ingress, uh, they can get uh, coated not by silver, but by rust. And then the interconnection of copper gets very bad. So there is some challenges ahead. 
That's right. The, and and we know that copper plating is really widespread in kind of ICT, but you expect a kind of computer or a, or a tablet or some kind of device like this to last for maybe five years, not 25 plus years that we require of a solar module. Josie, from, from um, Ryzen, I want to bring you into the conversation. The Ryzen heterojunction modules are branded Hyper Ion. I understand that your cell interconnection technology, which is kind of in the broad class that's known as zero busbar these days, or busbarless interconnection. It's called hyperlink, I understand. Can you talk to me about um, why this technology um, can have an impact in terms of cost reduction um, in heterojunction module manufacturing? Yeah, sure. So we have also been doing our analysis and we have been thinking which technology to commercialize when, uh, when speaking about our uh, hyper ion uh, products. And uh, we have actually not selected the, the, the co electro uh, copper plating, nor have we selected other uh, technologies uh, patented, for example, as a smart wire, uh, either due to uh, high implementation costs or, uh, or the patent. So what we are using actually to reduce the, the amount of silver um, we are using, um, when it comes to the cell technology, we are using um, uh, low content silver uh, paste. And this paste is, um, is composited out of uh, or based uh, on the particles of other um, conducting uh, metals, which are, um, uh, which are more abundant, uh, less expensive. And basically these very small uh, particles of uh, either copper or, uh, or cobalt or, or zinc uh, they are uh, being encapsulated with a very thin layer uh, around 80, 100 uh, nanometers of uh, pure silver. And thus, uh, uh, basically, we are isolating this, uh, these metals from um, re reacting or, or basically getting in touch with the surface of the, uh, of the cell. And uh, thanks to this, we are able to reduce significantly the amount of uh, silver. So we are now even reaching the, the amounts of uh, silver per watt at the level of uh, almost perk uh, modules. So that is a big uh, achievement. When it comes to bus bars, um, at which, which we implement at the module manufacturing stage, we are using uh, silver uh, coated uh, copper wires. So that is, that is our uh, strategy that we have. Uh, implemented and indeed silver is um, is a thing because uh, we uh, estimate that when it comes to cost of the uh, HDT module it's the second most uh, cost generating component uh, after uh, silicon of course so there is a lot of things to to consider here and there is a lot of thought uh, to be put in order to optimize this um, this component. Okay, interesting. And does does the solution or the zero bus bar hyperlink does that use bismuth as a material from Ryzen? I know that some uh, bus barless has used bismuth in the past. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, there is also a thing about bismuth, although it is um, less spoken or less discussed greatly, um, and maybe it's not for a uh, for a bad reason. Uh, so bismuth actually and bismuth alloys are being used when it comes to um, connection of the of the bus bars with the with the cells and basically bismuth is uh, used as an equivalent of tin and it is used because of uh, the uh, because we can actually uh, attach and solder these kind of alloys uh, bismuth based in a fairly low temperatures. And this is quite crucial because the outer layers of the HJT cells, they are susceptible to high temperatures. So, so any temperatures higher than, for example, 200 degrees could impair the, the output efficiency of the ready-made uh, product. But uh, I would say uh, there are actually uh, two things which I wanted to, to, to add. First of all, I think this is um, a transitional um, transitional technology. So uh, the fact that we use utilize bismuth doesn't mean today doesn't mean that we will continue to utilize it for the next ten years. Um, uh, the amount of bismuth will be um, uh, reduced over the years. 
uh, over the time, uh, or even the technology will be um, will be changed to a different technology that does not uh, utilize bismuth. And the second thing is actually the uh, the world resources of bismuth, because um, depending on the reports that you actually read, and depending on the time from where these reports have been written. If you look into, for example, 2016-17 reports, you could uh, you could indeed see uh, some alarming messages that the resources are scarce. But then, if you look at in the newest reports from, for example, from 2022, uh, they actually uh, uh, question this uh, those those old reports, stating that actually the, uh, the 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 new resources have been have been found and the capacity manufacturing capacities have been increased. So. Uh, that's another thing that needs to be taken in the, in the consideration. It's definitely not the same, I would say, topic as the as the silver. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, when when prices increase, they, uh, that that manufacturers or miners and 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 suppliers increase capacity, and they can find some more if the price is high enough, I suppose. Um, Gregory, this is a question without notice um, from NG's perspective. We're talking about heterojunction, and we saw in the Tongwei presentation, a lot of the advantages that, that that company is proposing for its heterojunction modules. We've got two leading heterojunction manufacturers on the panel now. Does, how closely are you looking at technologies like heterojunction? It's been on the horizon for utility scale applications for many years, but of course kind of just got outcompeted on cost by P-type PERC. How closely are you looking at it today? Well, we are looking. At, we are looking at it a lot because uh, we believe it's the future. Uh, in terms of technology, we are more today on, on Topcon. Uh, we passed uh, last year 800 megawatt projects, and we are a bit uh, in advance. Uh, to give you about the process, normally uh, we check uh, the um, direct impact. It can be the immediate losses and reduction, the LID or the temperature coefficient. And it's done by the technological department. Huh? And then we check uh, the annual degradation uh, of the new technology. Uh, for example, uh, that's what we do with Topcon. And uh, we calculate a business plan and an and DLC. Uh, and then uh, with the technology department, we are able to take a decision based not on the facial cost, but the total cost of ownership uh, on time. You know, we. We need to be very prudent because most of the, our panels, they get to Africa, they get to India, uh, they get to US. And it is very important for us to be able to have a good quality right for the first time. So uh, this department is following uh, the technologies and we are uh, checking the, the, the risks that we could have uh, with them and the opportunities for sure. And uh, for, for NG today, I would say we are on Topcon, on distributed uh, we are on HGT, and even though a bit further, uh, but it's more on lab uh, test. No, we are uh, checking a pair of skies and, and and the next technologies. Okay. We will continue on Topcon for the coming uh, two years, and then we we, we really believe that HGT uh, and back contact will be the the next steps. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for those insights. Well, we are talking about material consumption with heterojunction. It was also thought um, that indium could potentially delay widespread or, or mainstream or very large-scale heterojunction manufacturing. Christian Comas from Huasan, can I put this question to you? Uh, the indium is of, often used in the transparent um, conductive oxide layer, the TCO layer of a heterojunction cell. Um, uh, do we have enough indium to supply um, Huasan, Ryzen, and other heterojunction manufacturers today and into the future? So that's a good question, if we have enough indium or not. Um, I would like to share the same view as it was said before, um, that uh, most of the time the studies that show how much of a material is available, they are depending on variables that are no longer the same in the future. So I remember a few years ago, my colleagues at the time at Panasonic laughing about all of the mass media reports about lithium short availability and they told me yeah if you raise the price of lithium by 10 percent you have three times more availability everywhere you don't need to go to bolivia and it was that way like we use so much more lithium today and there's not a problem so i i don't feel qualified to answer if there's enough 
indium. But what could happen is that the price of the indium becomes too expensive because of the um, processes necessary to get it out of the earth. And for that, uh, we see already some technologies going into substituting indium by other materials that are uh, cheaper in this sense. Um, this is a little bit of a very different situation compared to substituting or eliminating uh, silver because many of the things we're doing to substitute silver is, are getting a low, lower cost and maybe even higher efficiency. For instance, the fingers are much more spread or thinner than they used to be before, so you have more bifaciality in heterorection as of today. But in terms of indium, the technologies that are uh, out there about to be ready for mass production for no indium, typically they require a, a trade-off in terms of lower efficiency. So probably they will only be used in case the indium really becomes very scarce or really very expensive in the reality, not just in predictions. So maybe that's something that we will talk about in two years, not today. Okay, well, thank you for that. Let, let's talk about performance then. We heard from Gregory before about how Angie kind of does the assessment on, on um, total cost of ownership and LCOE. Um, uh, Jung Tse Yan, can I bring you back into the conversation about performance? You know, we hear about heterojunction superior temperature coefficient, it's superior bifaciality, not only when it's compared to P type PERC, but also uh, over and above what to N type TopCon can achieve. Um, how much confidence do you think buyers in the market can have that heterojunction cells today will perform and are performing? Um, up to these enhanced expectations. Also for durability as well, for degradation over time, because that's another advantage that, that is uh, advocated by um, heterojunction manufacturers, durability and performance. Uh, can we trust these figures that we, we see on the data sheets? Oh, thank you for this question. Yeah, I have a lot to say actually. So, yeah. Compared to the uh, compare the N type with P type, yeah, we have seen some statistic data to show the advantage of N type. Uh, for example, for heterojunction and top call lower temperature coefficient and lower light induced degradation. Uh, so so many things that we've tested it already in the lab, and we can see it's the truth that it really have like some. Yeah, benefits for the end type. And also for the energy yield, we've done some outdoor energy yield to uh, see the performance between end type and P type. And also compared a little bit from uh, Topcon and heterojunction, uh, there is some yeah, improvement of energy yield of end type. And yeah, the difference, but the difference between heterojunction and Topcon is actually not big. Uh, however, these are all on testing level and on the small uh, application level. So uh, it is hard to say how we can evaluate these technologies until we can uh, we put into like uh, practical a uh, large practical applications. So we get more data and uh, to see longer effects for these models. So we really need more large-scale applications, which I imagine uh, companies like Angie are doing, looking at uh, test beds and also, you know, their projects that they develop and own and operate over um, over a long period of time. And we often hear that you know the first generation of N-type products were primarily targeted at the distributed generation space, so the rooftop space. When we're talking about gigawatts of manufacturing capacity, of course, that means that the heterojunction has to be going into large-scale applications. Um, Jersey, is, is that something that Ryzen is looking to do to, to also serve um, the large-scale market with heterojunction modules? And are there yeah. particular applications that are better than others? Like, obviously, I remember some of the old uh, uh, Sanyo or Panasonic heterojunction modules were wonderful on areas where there was snow because the bifaciality was just a massive boost. Are, are there specific applications and how closely are you pushing heterojunction products into the large scale segment? Yeah, I think we generally have to sort of fight this misconcept that have been 
uh, around or have been generated uh, a few years ago that HGT is only a good product for high-end rooftops. Uh, I think it all depends actually how you design the product. Because obviously you can you can design it to serve it well on the rooftops, but I think the real potential you can have it in the large scale uh, farms, and uh, this is actually how uh, our products are, are designed. So we are using, for example, the the large size uh, G12 cells, okay, which have been proven to 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 bring uh, or, or basically to bring the cost down, to bring the BOS savings, as was shown uh, in the previous uh, Tongwe I think presentation, yeah. Um, so, so, so that is, for example, uh, one fact. Uh, the second fact, obviously, you also mentioned already this, so bifaciality, okay? So when we are implementing these uh, modules on the ground, uh, whether it is a fixed tilt or, or actually a tracker, uh, we can actually have additional gain from the backside because HJT currently has the highest efficiency of the backside. And particularly, I think, for... Um, for plants uh, which uh, incorporate trackers, they have dedicated algorithm ac actually to utilize this backside under certain uh, sun or light conditions. So um, also when you, for example, imagine fencing, yeah, PV fencing or agro PV, again, the, there, there are numerous of um, use cases where you could actually take an advantage of the of the high bifaciality of, of 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 the cells, and actually from what we have sold here in Europe, from the from the quantities that we have sold, uh, and from the quantities that we are actually selling now, or we have signed the, the agreements, around ninety five percent of the projects these are ground mounted utility scale at least above ten uh, megawatt size projects. So this also it uh, shows how uh, well these uh, these products are being um, uh, looked for for this kind uh, kind of of, of plants. Mm, fencing, so kind of vertical applications, which is a really interesting yeah. um, niche. niche. Uh, Christian Comas from Huasan, um, how are you addressing the utility scale market? We only have a couple of minutes, so let's keep all our answers relatively yeah, short. I will do it very shortly. Um, <laughs> It's very clear that heterogeneous is better for utility scale. Uh, the point, first point is for EPCs, that higher efficiency will save installation cost. So balance of system, BOS. The second point is that the yield is higher. Uh, this is not based on some kind of uh, marketing material. This is based on measured temperature coefficient, which is lower than TopCon. It's by faciality, which is higher than TopCon. It is low light performance, which is better than TopCon. So the reality is this trinity, holy trinity of the module characteristics brings something like one, two, three, four percent more yield to heterogeneous compared to TopCon. So we think that all things together is not in two years. It is already now. And the one point that is not related to performance and it really gets forgotten all the time is that heterogeneous is not a new technology that needs to prove that it doesn't break down into two years. The modules from Sanio that I sold 15, 17, 20 years ago, those systems are running and they are running well. Uh, so it is a proven technology because the basic cell structure, it has not changed. So this is the track record there that other newer uh, upcoming technologies don't have. So we think that uh, that is super important for utility scale and that is present there. And the cost difference from heterogeneous to a topcon is not as high as the benefit in LCOE. So we think is the time for heterogeneous in utility scale is, is here, is today. Okay. And not just from us, from the industry. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, one technology that is very, uh, on the horizon that m doesn't have a long track record is perovskite tandems. Generally, it's coupled with heterojunction from what we've seen these ver very early products uh, being developed uh, being developed. One of the major hurdles, however, um, is durability. Um, Jan, can you, can you speak to where you, how you understand uh, perovskite durability and, and what that means for market applications? Again, we've only got just a minute or two left. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Yeah, durability of perovskite, yeah, that's the problem causing a lot of interest these years. Um, 
I have, I have to say, to be honest, we are still seeking for more reasonable testing methods for perovskite durability, and we don't uh, we haven't reached any agreement yet at IEC committee. Uh, as far as we can see, yeah, some perovskite models have passed the inference stage quality test, and some yeah also safety and construction verifications. Uh, and also, we tried some long-term extended stress tests uh, with these models, but these long-term extended stress tests are designed for silicon models. Although the results shows it, uh, the results are not bad. However, it is sure that there will be some degradation mechanisms we've never seen with silicon models that will occur. Uh, very typical for perovskite, and uh, so. Yeah, because the first cut, uh, it's not very stable. And when we uh, talking about tendon seal, uh, the matching, the uh, current matching between the first cut and uh, the silicon more uh, silicon seals uh, needs to be um, yeah very very precise. Otherwise, the yeah power output will be even lower. Although uh, theoretically, it will have a higher efficiency performance, but it depends on the matching of the current. So let's, I have to say, let's wait a little bit until it has some, yeah, application experience or at least some large production. Okay, so it's not just that the periscates themselves have durability challenges. We have to l develop the methodology as to how to actually test them appropriately. Um, Gregory, I'll give you the last word just in a few seconds. Um, are you excited by this technological landscape that you see in front of you as a developer? Yeah, we are very excited. Uh, we discuss a lot with the suppliers uh, for us. Tandem and perovskite is facing too much challenge, stability and lifetime. The TRL is too low, but you know the the, the solar market is is moving every uh, uh, every year. Huh? So uh, we'll see. Uh, but yes, we're exciting because uh, there is a lot of new things happening. Um, uh, we have to face the cost huh, in front. The the market is also a quick market if we compare to uh, wind or other markets. And renewables are booming. Uh, we are thinking about uh, 392 gigawatts on this year, which is more than the total uh, nuclear plant. So every year is a, is a new bet. And uh, yeah, we are exciting for, for next year uh, because we believe uh, that uh, lots of things will happen, and uh, especially on technologies. Well, I think that's a good message to conclude our panel on. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Christian Comes from Huasan, Gregory Likop from Angie, uh, Josie Rudnicki from Ryzen Energy, and Yunse Yan from Tuf Sud Greater China. Thank you very much for joining Roundtables Europe uh, 2023. Thank you. And thank you also for your attention for joining this next generation cell and module tech session. We'll be taking a 45 minute break now and during the break you can explore the virtual expo booths of our partners or use the time to connect with other experts through the platform's various networking features from matchmaking to joining the lounge. After the break I'll be back with our session addressing sustainability in solar, in particular the evolution of low carbon solar. So do join me then in just a few minutes as we discuss how much low carbon really matters when it comes to PV module production and where the biggest emissions savings do lie. I'm Jonathan Gifford, the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine Global, and this is Roundtables Europe 2023.